Fog It is a high performance fogging oil designed especially for internal combustion engines. Fog It can be used by everyone. If you have a lawnmower, a jet ski, a motorcycle, a tractor, a high performance car, a classic car, racing vehicles, if it has a cylinder wall, it needs Fog It. For more than a decade, FTI has strived to become the leader in the aftermarket, performance, transmission, and converter industry. We've joined forces with McLeod Driveline Components under the leadership of Top Fuel Funny Car Pilot Paul Lee, and now have a larger distribution network, more resources, and more power. Come see us in the pits and ask how you can join the FTI family. It's not cheating, it is the competitive edge. This is WFO Radio. Hey everybody, WFO Radio is on another week, another show. How crazy it has been to be in town for two consecutive weekends. I don't know what to do. We got a great show for you today, though. The voice of the NHRA, Alan Reinhardt, going to join us on the program, and Clay Milliken. The defending race winner for the Gerber Collision in Glass Route 66 NHRA Nationals out there at Route 66 Raceway is going to be joining us on the show as well. So we're going to hear from Clay. He's got a lot going on. We're going to hear from Reinhardt. Reinhardt was down there at No Problem Raceway at the Lloris Motorsports Insurance Sports Nationals. I was here in town. Formula One was in town. I didn't go. I didn't go this year. That's two years in a row. Decided to take the weekend off and, uh, you know, do other things, you know, housework domestic things, et cetera, and so on. we got all that going on. I see Clay is already signing on. Uh, Reinhardt didn't get the li link. Uh, you know, let's see, try again. If I was going to improve one thing about my life, I would be a better text typer. That's what I would do. I would, I would type better. I think I would be so much more efficient uh, doing all of those things. All right, before we get started, I got to tell you about the people who make it possible, but also want to let you know that WFO merch is on sale right at this second. Right at this moment, it is on sale discounted, and everybody's always asking about the fire T-shirts, and they are on sale for just 16 bucks. So uh, get yourself one of those shirts in the WFO store and support the program like our great sponsors. Hopefully, uh, you know, Clay is re-Xing the show. That's what we need everybody to do, repost on X. We're getting so many p uh, viewers out there from repost on X because they're doing such a great job of letting people know that there's a live show on the air. That's really what it's all about. Like, where are the live shows on X? And uh, you don't have to go far to see WFO is on the air. All right, CWT Industries. We're talking balance machines for all kinds of things. If it rotates, it can be balanced. Here's the deal. Tomorrow on the show, in the noon hour, from noon till one, uh, right around 1230, I believe, Randy Neal from CWT Industries is going to be joining us on the show. So we're going to be talking about the importance of balancing. Balance machines, what they do, how they work, why it's important. If you've got a question, if you've got a machine shop, if you don't have a CWT Industries balancer, join us on the show tomorrow. You'll learn a whole lot about uh, CWT Industries, and you can always check out their website. From Big Cat 3500 Earth Movers to Marine Applications to your typical LS or small block Chevrolet. They make the balancers. Check them out, cwtindustries.com. You already heard a little bit about FTI performance transmissions and torque converters. Uh, just look in the winner's circle and you'll see their decal is there on a regular basis. Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology, totalseal.com. Hartford was testing this past weekend. We'll see if they've got it going on for their sponsor's race, the Getrix Pro Stock All-Star Callout. Now, I've got the list. There's a big press conference tomorrow. Erica gets to make first pick. That's going to be interesting. Total Seal always gets first pick. Totalseal.com. Make them your first call, not your last call. Our great friends at phillips-connect.com for their smart trailer technology. Bernie Speed Shop, over 100,000 square feet. Frame off restorations. Buying, selling on consignment. They sell e-bikes. They do everything in the world of automotive and custom uh, up there in Ocala, Florida. They're just 10 minutes away from Big Daddy Don Garlands. Go to Bernie's.com to find out more information. Plus, our great friends at Samtech.edu, our great friends at Frank Hawley's Drag Racing School, my main man, Marvin Rodak, Rodak's Coffee and Grills.com. Oh, yes. All right. 
Reinhardt is uh, checking his phone and his computer. He's still getting nothing. I've sent him the email several times. And so Reinhardt's just over. No Reinhardt. Let's bring on Clay Milliken, our main man, so he can talk while I send uh, Reinhardt the actual link. That's what I'll be doing, sending him the link. What's up, Clay? How are well, you? I am sitting here. I was scrolling while I was listening to you talking about all the, the cool stuff that you do. And uh, it's weird to say re-X. Yeah. I text you that today. It's like, is it Sarah. really X or is it still Twitter? I mean, you know, a retweet sounds correct. A re X just sounds wrong. Well, you got to say repost on X. Is repost the way on have, X? Is, yeah. that, is that the correct way? Okay. No, All it's right. not. I don't think there's any correct way. As, as someone who, as you know, it's my job to figure out how to say things pretty smoothly to get to the next word, right? Uh, how do you re X something? It's like re X. It's like react, re X. What is that? It doesn't make sense. It's hard to get to the next word. So I have calculated. Then repost on X is the best method by I which like that. to do it. repost on so, X. Yes. I like it. Repost on X. I did I'm that. I'm open to whatever else you might have to say on that. I know you've always been really big on X, Clay, from the very beginning. Back in the day, you were one of the people to take advantage of the X format uh, early. I know, you know, but it's funny. I have, I still pay attention to it, and I still post on it, X on it, whatever. But I don't know for whatever reason, I don't interact as much on there. And I don't really know why. I mean, you know, to me, Instagram's become so easy. You know, it's just like post a picture, boop, done. I don't know. Uh, after it changed, I don't know. I've just felt a little different about Twitter. And I, that's probably silly, but I do. I feel a little different. It's not called Twitter anymore, but that's just me. I agree with you. Honestly, I agree with you, but see, here's, here's how it works B behind the scenes, guys, this is inside baseball. I promise you, we're going to talk about clay running 337.92 <laughs> miles an hour and being the defending race winner in Chicago. I want to hear about the GTO Reinhardt is signing on. We got him finally connected. It is all great, but we need everybody to repost on X. Here's the deal, clay, you know, that everything like everyone is governed by their own self-interest, right? So here I am doing WFO every week. I use a software called StreamYard. I'm trying to grow the audience dutifully. And I've got all these social media algorithms, which I know you know about as a YouTuber. You got to do the right things and you got to put the right hashtag and you got to tag this person and you got to put like there's a there's a method. Well, yes. on X, the the StreamYard software that I use and everybody is welcome. You can email me if you want to uh, know more about it. Um, X never connected to it. You were going out, but you never knew who you were reaching. And recently, they somehow made the connection. And I saw my numbers go from a good show, I'd have 150, to the other day, I had 1,500. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. And so it, it, it blew my mind. And everybody in the audience knows I'm always talking about defeating the algorithm. Share, repost, retweet, share, please, help, beg, all those things. I'm not above it. And finally, one day, all of a sudden, the numbers were massive, right? Because of people reposting on X. And that's it. It just all of a sudden, from one day to the next, I became a fan. All right, X. <laughs> There's people there. Gosh darn it, X people. <laughs> Share away, guys. Retweet, because you're about to hear Clay Milliken uh, tell us some great stuff. So there's my inside baseball on X, at least was connected to WFO on StreamYard and how we do our show each week and why we are now focused. But honestly, Facebook, um, their groups have disconnected just the other day. Can't stream directly to the Facebook groups anymore. So I have gone all in on YouTube. I've seen you. I'm following your lead. Kind of a different format in that we do the show and you're doing YouTuber stuff. But it seems like at le very least a reliable system that the audience, when they subscribe and click the bell, when you post, will know. And I've noticed that through your postings. Yeah, you know, YouTube, it, obviously, I spend way too much time doing it, but I quite enjoy it. And it's funny, you talk about hashtags, algorithms, all that. I have no clue how it works, but I do know that I spend so much time on the thumbnail. The thumbnail is the key on YouTube, whether or not people will watch. I can do a video that I think is the most incredible thing, and I can tell when I'm editing the video, like, man, this is good. And nobody watches, you know, because it's not, I don't put 
some crazy, you know, title and have some crazy, you know, top fuel engine, you know, on fire and booming and, oh, there's our buddy Billy. But, uh, you know, it's just so crazy, you know, how it works. I mean, yes, you have your core audience just like you do that always watch, but you don't grab the outsiders if the thumbnail's not right or there's the hashtag is not correct. It's really hard to figure it out. Right. Exactly. And I talked, you know, now we're getting real deep inside baseball, but this is good. You mentioned Billy, Billy Carroll. He says X is his number one platform, especially on race day, because you get instant results. And I totally agree. I try to be reasonably active on X, but at the same time, you've got those people who are like, don't tell me the results. And it's like, right. well, then don't get on X because yep. that's where the results are going to be. But you're so right about the thumbnail. And I always talk to Steve, our art guy, because that's how I pick what to watch on YouTube. But yep. That's how I pick the thumbnail. Like, which pretty girl is down there in the thumbnails? Like, oh, look at that. Look, she's got a, a, a coffee this morning and it's too hot. I'll <laughs> click that. Oh, okay. Because of the dumb thumbnail. So there's an art form in there, I guess. Have you gotten to the point where you don't watch television and you watch YouTube? Well, I've I'm wasted there. a lot of life on YouTube, definitely. Yeah. And uh, I still watch television, but I am considering cutting the cord very, very seriously right now. Like it's happening. The bill is coming and I'm thinking to myself, do I really need UVerse anymore? Can I get away with YouTube TV or just YouTube or just Internet yeah. and, you know, scrolling the reels and finding out what's going oh, on? Oh, yeah. Here? Yeah. All right, let's, let's bring on Reinhardt because normally he would have come on. Uh, but we just had some sort of weird uh, internet issue. But now he's here. What's up, Ar? How are you? All good. All good. I was just updating my Facebook or my uh, my 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 MySpace while you guys were talking about it. So, <laughs> did you repost on X, Alan? You know, we see a huge bump when Alex when Alan reposts on X. That X got into your name, Alan. It's like the X keeps taking over everything. Well, so I did repost on there. I'm, it's strange though because I'm, I'm right now. I still have not received an email from you. Um, and like I said, I was looking at my computer, I would check an email on my phone and I didn't receive it either place. So when you texted it to me, I was able to sign it, but I don't know what's going on. You'll get like five or something. 10 of them in a row rapidly. Yeah. Is this, this internet, uh, why is it not totally perfect just yet? I mean, it's been around for like 30 years. We should have this thing totally dialed in that it always works perfectly. I, nah, I need to call Al Gore and get it figured out. Get it figured out, Al. <laughs> get it figured out. I mean, my gosh. It's 25 years into this experiment. We should have this thing dialed in by now. I mean, why can't I stream from an airplane through American Airlines free Wi-Fi? What the heck? You can't? <laughs> no, you can't stream uh, outgoing, you know, I don't think. No. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, that, that, that's I'm bandwidth. Okay, Lee's out there. Everybody's out there. You got a huge audience out here, Clay. This is amazing. So the, the reason I wanted you on the show, Clay, is because... He's to run his numbers up. Well, if there is, see, it doesn't work like that, Alan. Like, I like to think that the WFO universe follows our guests. But in this case, I think Clay is probably bringing people to WFO. But if there is a WFO listener who hasn't subscribed to Clay's YouTube channel, you better do it right now and leave him a comment on the latest video, which I just checked out, Clay, before we talk drag racing. The GTO is gone. That's it. Well, it is left Drummond's Tennessee. Uh, it hit the old pilot transport truck on Saturday and I was texting with the people at CRC. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of sad, kind of happy because I gained shop space back, but also very nervous because I've never been involved in any kind of auction at all. I don't know how it's going to do. I know there was a lot of money spent on that car and I know all the money's going to charity no matter what happens, but I even called Jeff Lutz. And uh, I'm like, man, maybe one of us should get a bidding card. And, you know, what if this thing goes cheap enough that uh, we should buy it because we know what's there? You know, it, it's actually very nerve wracking. There's no reserve on the car. And I'm just telling you, it is an absolute museum quality car. So much so that I never once, I drove it a whopping four miles, never once went full throttle. I never squeaked the tires on the back of the thing because it, it, it's too nice. Like it's way too nice a car for me. I'm, I'm mean to stuff. Like I love smoking tires and, and, you know, sliding around and, but that car is absolute perfect. And I didn't drive it. I drove it four miles. That's it. 
so if memory serves me right, because I, I remember you gave me stress. This was a stress thing. Like I literally, <laughs> guys, I woke up in the middle of the night and I said to myself, it's not my place, but I've got to tell Clay, don't cut the GTO. Like, don't do it. Because that was the original plan. But it's got, what does it have? 4,000 miles on it? Something ridiculously like ultra low miles? 2006 model, it has 1,387 miles on it. Okay. And so I know yes, yesterday the uh, pilot transport guy, Brian is his name. Brian is awesome. He, he hauls cars for the stars and I'm not one of them, but he posted yesterday that he may actually end up driving the car further than I have because where Mecham had them park it, they had to drive it a mile or something to get it into the, wherever it's going. This car. It is, it is perfect. I'm telling you, the car was absolutely incredibly perfect. And yes, you among hundreds, maybe thousands of others blew us up on YouTube and other social places to not touch that car. We'll do it. Because, Clay. <laughs> yeah. We did not do anything that cannot be undone. You know, we, we initially were going to paint it yellow because our theme of this car was to make it look like Jeff's street outlaws NPK GTO. And the more we looked at it, we're like, we would be total idiots if we painted this car. So we wrapped it. So you can simply pull the wrap back off. Every bolt and nut that has been taken off that car is bagged and tagged and it's at Jeff's shop. And it would take only a few hours to put it back exactly the way it was from factory. Uh, nothing was molested, so to speak, on the car at all. So this is like a quadruple collectible car. Uh, I want to get to, you know, what, where the money's going, because that is tremendous too. And everybody repost on X, but I have a GTO, a 2005 GTO. It just rolled over 18,000 miles. And I've had a lot of people like try to try to, you know, express interest to it. And I'm thinking about selling it because I want to re, uh, re redirect the funds to the project Pontiac super street program, but it's a Pontiac. It's a limited run Pontiac GTO that was made in Holden uh, made in Australia by Holden, which no longer exists. Like neither one of those entities exist anymore. And they both have their fans and are popular. Uh, it's ultra, ultra, ultra low miles that was purchased by a drag racing celebrity that has media support and backing. Like, uh, you know, everybody, you're, you're a TV person for many, many years, drag race high, all of those things. So it's known the fact that clay, this is clay's car that you guys did a project and, Oh, by the way, it's going, the money is going to something that is near and dear to all of our hearts. Tell everybody, it, this thing's got to bring in some cash, Clay. This has got to bring in money. It needs to bring in a lot of cash because what CRC Industries, which I mean, most everybody knows them as the brake clean company, and, and that's an amazing product. They're an amazing company, but they're the ones that spent all the money on it. I mean, yes, Jeff, myself, Emily Reeves, Bogey, Bogey's Garage, you know, we all got some time invested in this car, but there are going to be 10 scholarships given out from the proceeds of this car being sold. And those scholarships are for tech schools and not just mechanics and all that, but it could be, you know, HVAC electricians, any kind of tech school funds. So CRC partnered up with Tech Force Foundation, and that's kind of what they do. They direct funds for kids that need it for scholarships if they're learning to work with their hands, that's what we need. And that's what's happening with all this money. All the money is going straight to the Tech Force Foundation. And we're already in the process of doing this again next year. Uh, we haven't completely jumped in on, on the project that we have, but it's just amazing. I mean, I, I mentioned CRC, but there's several companies that are, that are I mean, they are in fully on, on making this happen. Uh, that it would be Edelbrock Comp Cams is a huge part of it and summit racing is a huge part of it. And then there's a lot of other people that, you know, when it comes to making kids be working with their hands, they're all in for it. And so we've got another project already, you know, like say started and it's an absolute beautiful car. And you Pontiac people, you get pretty wound up when uh, you start messing with cars, but the next one, we are really going to stir it up. And I can't tell you what we're doing, but I can tell you that, it is a gorgeous 1957 Chevrolet that we're going to do some crazy stuff with. This one, we're going to get a little more carried away. The Pontiac, again, was so close to absolute perfect stock. We did not get carried away. This 57 is going to be a little 
different. I love it. I love I love it. Good job. Don't mess with a bandit Trans Am, Clay. Like, don't do anything. Like <laughs> Burt Reynolds owned this bandit Trans Am, and now what we're gonna do to it? Don't do that. All right, let's talk drag racing. Reinhardt, hit him with hit him with some questions, Alan. I just was going to suggest that, you know, if he's looking for another GTO, Joe Costello's got a low mileage, uh, 05. He'll make you a smoking deal on it. And, you know, you're already familiar with what you got to what you got to do to those things. So, you, you know, you can turn this into a GTO factory. Okay. Exactly. That's and true. One, and this one you can paint, right? Because that's that's the one, the downside of it, since I'm trying to sell the car now. Um, the paint did not hold up to the South Florida sun. You know, we had it covered somewhat and we maintained the heck out of it. But. Uh, you know, the plastic pieces, the paint flaked off. I did some research on the GTOs. That's kind of a common problem. Driveline wise, though, it's awesome. And uh, I am, I am, uh, you know, we, we kind of want to keep it, but we don't have the space. Just like you said, shop space, effort, it, you know, it, it, it deserves to run. This thing deserves a home that's going to love it and let it run. Yeah, you know, that was one thing about the, the one that we currently, that's at Meekum Auction right now is the paint was perfect, which is kind of unusual for a silver car. Silver paint is known for falling off, and this car obviously spent its life inside, and the paint is perfect underneath that yellow wrap. Silver cars are, are tough. Mine is silver. That's it. It's silver. Yeah. The pit's getting hazy. I did not know that. And so, uh, just not to be too personal on this thing, but I have a 1998 Pontiac Firebird six-cylinder, five-speed manual, you know, $17,900 base price. Um and the paint is perfect on it. And I don't know what to say. I don't want to blame our Australian brothers and sisters down there for not painting it well. I like, I don't know. But side by side, the Firebird, man, the paint is amazing. And uh, the, the, the Holden, less. But what are you going to do, right? What are you going to do? Get exactly. it wrapped. Wrap it up. Flat black. Send it. Um, all right, Clay. 337.92 well, in the final round. Yes, Alan? A final thought? No, go ahead. I, I not, not at all. Go ahead. Just uh, that speed. That's big speed. Is that the fastest of your career? I think it is. It is. We actually increased my career and Jimmo and actually everybody on the race team's personal best twice. We did it in first round. We went 337.62, I think it was. And second round, we only went 333. I actually went in the trailer and I was like, Jimmo man, this thing's slow. It only went 333. And so he, he upped her a little bit in the final 337.92. And it's like, man, why couldn't we, you know, that, that 0 0.08 and just said it would went 338, you know? So, uh, all that is really is just Jimmo and Nikki working together. I mean, the power has been there, but it's, it's all about applying it earlier in the run. You know, we've been working actually, since partway through the year last year, lacking a little bit at half track speed. And then that's where we have found a little bit of ET, a little bit of mile an hour. And so makes the back half just go faster. And don't think it doesn't make me go, man, only a couple of miles an hour away. We can be the first top fuel car to hit that three, 340. That's a, you know, that's a big jump. Two miles an hour is a big jump. And we know that, but it's, it's possible. Alan. Clay, let's look forward. You've got a car that's running real well now. We're going to Chicago, where you're the defending champion. It's been a while since you've gone into a race as the defending champion. We know now, which we did at the beginning of the year, you're going to have four qualifying sessions. So you got two shots on it Friday. If Saturday, Saturday morning is cool, like it's known to be there, uh, that could be the time to really show off. So what are, you, what are your prospects heading to a racetrack where you won the last time you were there, going in there with a the car that's running like you've got right now? And, uh, you know, obviously you got to got to have a little extra pep in your step. Oh, I really do. I mean, because if you think about last year, we did not go into the race with any momentum at all. You know, I think, and Alan, you're the one that'll be able to help me with this. I think we qualified 15th and we did that on the last qualifying run. If I memory serves, I've had a lot of tire shake in my life. So my memory's not that great, but, uh, you know, and then on race day, it was like Jimbo just suddenly found the magic combination you know and we just marched our way right through the field and then that momentum continued on for a, a good part of the year last year but route 66 raceway has been pretty special first place i ever drove a top or raced a top fuel car i should say uh you Let's know we did the deal with, yeah 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 reverse burnouts and all that sort of stuff we'll, we'll leave that alone you gotta own, my, you gotta own my, it you just 
Oh, oh I, I do. Out. You know, I absolutely do. And I don't even know if you can see it, but there's a, that's actually a Route 66 poster. I don't know how to turn that oh, right yeah. there. There it that's is. A, got that's it. from Beautiful. Route 66. And, you know, so it's it's got a little special place for me. We had one there. I, mean, I, I want to get my facts straight here. So my first race was 1998, the opening weekend for the racetrack. 20 years later, which would have been 2018, I won that race. 25 years later, and those of y'all that know, there's another photo with a uh, top fuel car with a 25 on it. Yes. We, we won that. You know, we won at Chicago on our my 25th year driving a top fuel car, and it didn't work out technically correct according to Route 66 Raceway, but it was really their 25th year. We missed a year, so they, I think they called it their 24th, but it was really the 25th year the racetrack had been there. So the place has been really special for me and my family, you know, and, and our race team. But last year, it was like Jimbo found whatever it was he found last year to make the car go down the racetrack in trickier conditions. We didn't have that home run swing, but if it was tricky, we went out there and won. You know, that, that was kind of how it was at Chicago and, and then Denver's always tricky. And then St. Louis was kind of the same way. The three races we won, you know, last year. So back to what you said, Alan, I've drugged this out a long time here. Going in after making seven consecutive runs at Charlotte down the racetrack, we went down the racetrack every single run under power. The very first run was a planned shutoff. I shut it off early, but it still ran 377 at only like 305 because that was a planned shutoff. The gremlins, the bugs, whatever you want to call it that we've had, I think we're getting past that. We kind of started to get it figured out in Vegas and then Charlotte kind of showed us that, that we're kind of headed in the right direction. And so I'm definitely looking forward and going into uh, Joliet with the chest poked out a little bit because the car's running good. Well, and, and the race last year, I brought up the results just to kind of see how you got there. Uh, you know, it was, you were it, according to the ladder on NHRA.com, which is often correct. Uh, it's, uh, you ran, you were the 11th qualifier. You ran like in the first okay. round and you ran Doug in the second round. You ran Brittany to get to the final. And so just that. Langdon, Doug, Brittany in a row to get to the final round against Josh Hart. And you won in an unbelievable race where you had an 049 light. He's 52. You're 80 with a one. He's 80 with an eight. So that is just wheel to wheel all the way down the racetrack to win that deal. I talked to Jimmo in the winner circle and I know he's okay with me saying this. You know, he teared up. Like he said, he never, he, he considered he might not ever make it back to the winner's circle. He considered that m maybe some of the people out there were saying things about him. Maybe they were right. And that this was validation that they weren't right. And look, you guys went on to have a really strong mm -hmm. remainder of the season. That was a very, very significant race for the team, for you, for Rick Ware. And, uh, and most importantly, Jimmo, who now has Nikki with him and you've chased away the bugs. Yes. Nikki's been a huge addition to the team. You know, he's, a lot of people, we didn't make a big deal about it because Nikki didn't want us to. And y'all know me, I constantly have this out and I'm, I'm getting that content. Nikki's like, you know what? I just want to get moved in here at Rick Ware Racing. Nikki only lives a few hours from the race shop. So that, that made his life a little easier. You know, he can just drive to the shop and he does that a couple days a week. And, you know, he's such a, I mean, let's face it, his last name's Bonifant. You know, he's such a yeah. clutch guy, you know, and uh, it's been unbelievable. The changes that he makes, I'm, I, I, I'm not a crew chief. I can put the car together, but I'm not a crew chief. But I will watch him change the clutch package, change the floaters. And to me, I'm like, man, that's big changes. But it goes. I mean, we saw it. At Bradenton, obviously, Bradenton, you know, we, we tested very well there. You know, we ran Jimmo's career best ET. And, and again, I think everybody else is on the team's best ET, not mine, but theirs. And the speed started picking up. And that is, like I say, Nikki just kind of getting a handle on accelerating the car from 60 to 330, from 330 to eighth mile. And it, 
Jimbo making power has never been a problem. He makes big power, and, and now we've got Nikki there and just kind of putting it all together. And, yes, the bugs and gremlins we had, that happens. You know, that's that's just – that happens. And we now know what it was, and we won't do that again, you know. But having Nikki and him together is basically a nonstop – comedy act in the in the crew chief lounge because those two have so much history together and i have got a couple of videos with those guys but uh, we're going to continue to try to do story time with nikki and jimmo because whew, some of the stories you know it, it takes so much editing that it's almost not worth posting but uh they've got a lot of history together but you mentioned last year the three races you won were all um kind of like abnormal circumstance races mm -hmm. you had a car that was good there but maybe not, uh, maybe not so much in throwdown conditions. Do you feel like now you've got a car that in throwdown conditions you can go out there and get it done? I really do. You know, I, I really, really do think so. And it's just been a matter of, again, I, I keep mentioning that, you know, that 60 to 330, 330, and that's, that's what – Nikki has kind of brought again, power has never been a problem, but so it's like, we got a motor guy in Jimbo and we now obviously have, have one of the best clutch people there is in, in Nikki. And so I'm excited for Friday nights. Now we're used to, it's like, okay, we just need to not fall out of the top eight. You know, it was not our strong suit, uh, putting those big Friday night numbers up and, you know, a lot of races and, the three of us on here certainly know this. A lot of times qualifying is completely based on your Friday night run, you know, when the weather conditions are best, especially as we get into these summer months. And so I'm kind of getting a little bit giddy for those kind of conditions and knowing that this car is probably going to put up some ETs that, that it's not done in the past, you know, is yes, we've been able to run, you know, high sixties and that's kind of, what the car was doing. Uh, you know, we, we put up a couple of 66 in testing. And so now I'm looking forward to improving on that as we get into the kind of conditions that'll, you know, take those kind of runs. And I think we'll start to see that out of our car. I really do. And you got to do it. Like that's the way you have to run nowadays. Mm -hmm. If you're going to compete at this level, the bar has continued to raise in the days of uh, you know, just being out there, being one of the field is not enough. And I know Rick, um, he's become quite the personality out there, right? An interesting character, always willing to talk on the starting line. And of the NASCAR converts, right? Obviously, Tony, as, a, as the driver, is the media darling. But Rick Ware really doing well in his uh, time in the NHRA. You know, he's an amazing guy just in the fact that I don't know how he keeps up with all the things he does. You know, he's he's like the uh, ever ready bunny. You know, he just goes and goes and goes. But I'm going to say this and, and it's just simple fact. He absolutely loves this drag racing team. He loves the people on it. Uh, I mean, we have seen him at, at uh, multiple drag races where there was a huge NASCAR race going on. Now, are there times where he has no choice? He's got to be at the NASCAR races? Of course. But, you know, he's he loves the drag racing and, you know, he's actually very in tune with what's going on. You know, the, the NASCAR team actually is housed at RFK and the drag race team is housed in the space where Rick's office is. So he's out there every day, you know, he's checking in, he's checking on what you know, what's going on with the team. And, and it's pretty cool, you know, and he calls me, you know, sometimes he's like, what if we did this? You know, I'm like, mm, I don't know, you know, because, but he sees so many other forms of racing. He definitely thinks of things a little differently. And, you know, we're starting to, to do a few things differently just in, in, in the process, you know, and I mean, even when it comes to like, you know, things to make the servicing the car quicker. And that's something that the crew guys have been working on because, you know, in the NASCAR world, they think about them pit stops nonstop. That's, uh, you know, that's a team that that's all they do. Where drag racing, you know, we obviously, those crew members drive the trucks and trailers and the tow vehicles and they do all those sort of things a little differently. But we are starting to incorporate some of the other side of racing that he comes from into just how we do things at the pit area. Reinhardt, you dealing with a fly over there? 
I'm not, you know, I'm dealing with something. I, <laughs> I, you know, I've been out for a few weeks, so like the critters kind of come in and take over when I'm not here. Hey, Clay, you mentioned Rick Ware's enthusiasm for drag racing. Has there been any talk or any thought about adding another car? I mean, the two car teams for the last few years seem to be the ones that have the advantage, uh, whether it's a top fuel car or a funny car. Has there been any uh, any discussion about that? Absolutely, constantly, you know, but it has, Rick actually races for a living, as do I, I have no rentals, I have no other income from other than drag racing, but it is a constant subject, you know, would it be a top fuel car, funny car, who knows, but if this, how do I say this, if the right situation come about, he would add a car in a heartbeat, you know, but he's not going to just, you know, spend the millions of dollars it would take to do it just to do it. But is it a possibility? A hundred percent a possibility. I know he would love to do it and I think it would be awesome. And I don't like, again, you know, it just, we all know the deal, you know, right situation, right time, right things have to be in place, but he is definitely in, interested in adding another car. That is awesome. Okay, so Rod is out there, wants to know about the relationship with uh, with Bruce Reed and those guys down under, uh, and Nikki and everybody down there. Um, that is a very fun relationship that I got to know a little bit about because of our WFO audience. Oh, wow, look at that. We're at 809 watching live, Clay. 809. Awesome. That's pretty good. Everybody must be reposting on X. Good job, guys. <laughs> but, uh, you know, talk about that. That's It's got to be helpful to have, you know, more brain power, more ideas, more people. And you have to be in many ways, uh, you know, one of the go-to teams for the Australian drag racing fan to follow because of that relationship. Well, uh, it's it, the relationship. They, they I, I missed the name there, but Nikki in it's actually Jimmo and Bruce Reed, man, they are just best of friends and, Jimbo goes down there usually a couple times a year. Oh, Rod, thank you. Yeah, it's Jimbo and Bruce Reed. They have been longtime friends. Years and years ago, the Reed family bought a Kalita car, and Jimbo helped them get that thing going, and, and it, they just hit it off. You know, they, they're they in constant contact, and last year, you know, Bruce actually kind of took a hiatus, uh, allowed the kids to kind of run his family business, which is – he does a lot of really high end swim swimming pools in Australia. That's what, that's what Bruce does for a living really. And it's really neat. You know, we had him here and he was involved for more than half the season. And it's just amazing. What a great family they are. I mean, I always mention them as they are the, uh, the force family of Australia. I think 17, 18 top fuel world championships between his dad and his brother Phil that drives and, you know, they're great people, great family. And they were actually the, the family was at St. Louis field and Bruce's son was there. You know, it was pretty cool when we won that race with them there, but I don't know how to say that, uh, you can share information that far apart, but we absolutely do. I know when the, the Reed family's racing their car, Jimmo is, is getting, you know, updates from the race pack and, and vice versa. You know, we're trying to make their car a little more similar to our car, our combination here, you know, and uh, they're just good people. And, and, you know, you want to work with good people and the Reed family is certainly that. Alan. Clay, have you got a chance to go down there? Have you been to Australia, You've seen any of their facilities or been to any of their events? I haven't. And Bruce is on me all the time, you know, uh, to do that. And I just haven't been, like I say, Jimmo goes usually a couple times a year, I need to figure that out, but I really, you know, I would love to do it if I was toting a helmet with me to go to one of their events. You sure. know, I know from the pictures and the videos that I watch and man, some of the facilities down there just look incredible, you yeah. know, like really, really nice. Do you think that would be no, good you YouTube content? Like, I think that would be good YouTube content, Clay. Oh, a hundred percent. It would be, I mean, just the, uh, the trip alone would make good content because we know that's not like a, uh, a short flight to get there, you know, and that's been one of the, the hesitations is like, man, y'all can't see it, but I'm over here. My legs are, are bouncing up and down because I'm not very good at setting still. Most people that have pay attention to me, like I can't be still, I'm constantly on the go. Setting on an airplane that long would be rough for me. I would, uh, 
you know, like some of the old cartoons, I'd need a wooden mallet and whack myself in the head and call it, call it a few hours and maybe sleep. Now, wait a minute, though. Wouldn't it take you some time to get used to it? Because down there isn't the gas pedal on the other side and you have the steering wheels backwards. And I mean, the other Everything's side of the world, down. Go backwards. You know, that, that brings up something, Alan, that is like a pet peeve of mine. When I see people get in a dragster on the right side, I'm like, where are you from, Australia? You know, <laughs> you don't get in on the wrong side, even if it is a dragster. You know, we're a left-hand steer country, and but occasionally you see people get in from the right side, and that's like a fingers on the chalkboard for me. It's like you're getting in from the wrong side of the car. I hear it's bad luck, you know, racer superstition. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Um, all right, so there's another question out there uh, from a gentleman named Kurt Spittler who wants to know, how was it being on NHRA's Driven reality show? That was weird for me because I'm used to being the one doing the filming and not getting filmed all day long. And, uh, you know, initially you're like you try to be on your P's and Q's. But once the uh, the day got going and you're mixing fuel and, you know, it's time to go, I just forgot about it. Uh, Kurt was man that's a, that's a good question you know but first part of the day it was definitely weird and what they didn't show on there was they dropped the cameraman which off at, at my motorhome bright and early in the morning which is kurt by the way i want to I know yeah you know, kurt, his kurt, name is kurt yes i joke this kurt yes is kurt who does the driven show for any yes kurt, yes know, yes I, I was trying to figure out how to do that say that oh, without saying okay. that. i wanted to let everybody know i was just being sarcastic <laughs> like, kurt's like how was the show clay yes <laughs> Clay, just so you know, if you have anything negative to say, it's okay to say it right now. Kurt is open <laughs> to constructive criticism. But here's yeah, the, he's the here's one who brought what, it up. Yes, yeah. you you can't tell this from that photo, but Kurt is a giant of a person. Yes, he's a big dude. So they drop him off, and I ride a Honda Ruckus from my motorhome to the pit area. We may or may not had a blowout when he was riding on the back, and we looked like Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> trying to head to the pit area. So I had to turn around and go back and then go pick him up on a golf cart because we, we had a flat on my, my scooter, <laughs> but it was fun. You know, I, I, I watched it and I think, you know, Kurt and everybody did a great job editing that out and it was kind of neat watch it, watching it. The whole drive to survive thing, right? Formula one was just in town. Um, not to go too deep into it, but the local community and the journalists were seeking out Formula One fans to talk to about their experience because our local news doesn't know anything about any kind of racing. And so they were find these, uh, you know, attractive 20 something fans wearing their Formula One gear and they would ask them and they were all knowledgeable and educated. Like one girl, she's like 23 years old. She's like, you know, I think Lando Norris can win this race because Mac and sure enough, he does. And all of that has to be because of Drive to Survive. People love the reality style behind the scenes shows. And that's what driven is. It showed what, you know, what are you up to when you're not driving the car? So I, I am not, I'm not, not a formula one fan, but I have to say this and I hope it makes people get wound up and furious about it. Formula one racing is 100% boring. It's horrible. You know, who's going to win. And that's what pretty much happens. You know, it's, if it wasn't for the announcers making it exciting, talking about the strategy, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. It's boring. It's just boring. Wow. I'm definitely going to clip that. Well, We're going to get some angry Formula One fans that are hopefully interested in NHRA drag racing, where we definitely have a, what I would call a more exciting race day product. But with their boring show, they have done amazing things. Oh, a hundred percent. hundred percent. And it is, you know, the drive to survive show, you know, has made it popular here. And, you know, again, the announcers make it exciting, but for Alan Reinhardt, one of the greatest announcers, when he's in the booth on Sunday and the number one qualifier is racing the number 16 qualifier, there's a legit chance number 16 can win. Is there a legit chance that the number 16 qualified car in Formula One is going to win? Nope. No, no, definitely, nope. not. definitely not. That is that is a fact. Wayne agrees. He says agree. A lot of people are agreeing with you that Formula One is boring to watch. Um, I find it exciting for very. Oh, it's it I, is, I, but you know, it's the to... it's the guys like you that make it exciting, and that's the well, announcers because the racing itself 
is there's no passing. There's nothing going to happen. This well, it's like soccer. Either. It's yeah. the same thing that soccer is for ball sports, right? Like you watch soccer, nothing happens. You know, they run in this way, they run in that way, and nothing goes in. But I'm sure if we got Brandon Bernstein on here, he would have 10 things that I can't, I don't notice that he would be like, Are well, you drinking three. a white claw? Are you drinking of a white claw? Of course not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't drink any alcohol. Could y'all imagine me with alcohol in my system? I have no, nothing against alcohol. I, I've never really talked about this like on any kind of public thing. I have nothing against alcohol, but alcohol and my body do not work. It's probably been 30 years or more since any alcohol has went in me because when alcohol hits my stomach, it comes right back up. So I'm a zero drinker. And yeah, let's, let's focus I, I can't, in on that story, Clay. How did you find this out? Well, I, I mean, as a, as a teenager, everybody is going to drink a beer or have, you know, sneak some of daddy's whiskey. And sure. It don't work. It don't work for me. You know, and, and again, the last thing I need, I'm bouncing off the walls anyway, is, is to have alcohol in my system. But I can't drink. I'm not man enough. Or my stomach's not man enough, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, hey, I like those Celsius. Those Celsius are actually a, a good beverage. I have a friend that comes by here for happy hour pretty regularly, and she is a white collar girl. So when you pick that up, I'm like, oh my God, really? <laughs> it's like you know, noon. But, so, you know, on, on, on Driven, when uh, Kurt was filming that, there was a young lady, and you've seen me putting on, I call it my sports bra when, when they're there, but I have two young doctors that I have a long time relationship with they're just awesome young people when i met them they were in college and and so they like data i don't know what they do with this data but they monitor when they come to the race they monitor me anyway long story short back to this celsius so they have told me they can argue either side of a celsius being good for you bad for you they you know the other energy drinks will will, will leave nameless because they're some of them are involved in the sport they said there is zero argument either way good or bad for you celsius is at the very least green tea based now do they like me drinking them all the time because they work with me to keep me healthy they don't but if you're going to drink an energy drink that one they said they can argue either side of it being good or bad for you i endorse what this guy is saying i have found the same to be true of course i'm a coffee in the morning guy because i got to get going i'm 51 years old it's all over slow walking to the grave everybody knows it but the Celsius, man, it feel there's no crash is really what it is. And, you know, yeah. race for people, we don't like to crash. Whereas all the others, all of them that you have one. And then two hours later, man, I'm starting to get tired, sleepy. If not, uh, you need another one to keep going again. And this up and down thing, me, I don't experience that. I feel like it's more of a workout supplement than yeah. it's an energy drink. Yeah. And uh, I, re I usually have one before we go do our announcing thing. And um, I'm good to go at least until like 4 p.m. I, I really like them. I really they, they come out of Florida, from what I understand too. Get them as a sponsor, Clay. Get your people on there. Why aren't oh, they? Uh, the well, they're, they're already very involved on the NASCAR side of things, and uh, I would just like a product deal because that way I wouldn't have to buy them. Yeah, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good point he's making, Alan. Sounds sounds like they need a funny car. Uh, yes, I'm exactly. Gonna go what, I'm going to go back to what. Clay said about Formula One, I am a huge fan of the technology. I think mm -hmm. that the technology that they utilize and what they do with those cars is amazing. But I also agree that the on-track product, if you can start on the pole, lead every lap and win the race, uh, you know, pit and come back out and still be in the lead, that just isn't exciting for me. I, I appreciate the technology, but I don't, I don't appreciate the on-track product very much. And I've always been a big believer and this is one thing that, you know, NHR was a little slow to the party on because go back in the Wally Parks days and he really believed that the cars were the stars, right? The smoke, the thunder, the flames out of the headers. That's what people came to see. But people come to see people. They don't come to see cars. The cars are a byproduct of it, but people come to see people. And anybody that doesn't believe that, look at how many people went to watch races where Tony Stewart was running the alcohol car last year that wouldn't go to a division race, but they went to yeah. see Tony Stewart, you know? And it's not it's not about the cars. You know, if you give me Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott and Denny Hamlin and Dale Jr. and four go-karts, I can sell 50,000 tickets in the parking lot behind my shop. 
Nobody's yep. coming to see the go-karts, they're coming to see the people. So yep. the driven thing, I think, is terrific. The drive to survive thing, and that's what it was all about. They were introducing people. So when you come to the race, okay, yeah, that's kind of a cool car. But whether you're a car guy or not, if they turned you into a Clay Milliken fan, then you're coming to see Clay, whether you're driving a top fuel car or whether you know, How many people came to, came to Gainesville because Kurt Busch was driving a super gas car one year? Right. They weren't coming to watch the 990 cars. They were coming to watch Kurt Busch try to do something different. And so anything like that and the, the job that Kurt does and all of the video people, all the social people, Nikki is a goddess to promote the personalities so that our race fans can just, you know, instead of, well, gee, that was a boring day. Nobody blew up. They can come out and go, I want to see what my guy or what my gal does out there on the racetrack. And I think that's a huge part of it. So I'm glad that. Um, NHRA is getting behind it at, at such a higher level now. I agree with that. And and on that very same note, if y'all remember back to the show, you know, Pink's All Out, it was huge. You know, number one on Speed Channel, blah, blah, blah. Well, when I first got invited to be a part of that whole thing, Rich Christensen, love him or hate him, you know, the arm drop guy, you know, he told me, he's like, you're going to be way more famous from doing this show than doing what you've done in a top fuel car. And I'm like, I don't know about that. And he's like, people know you with a helmet. They have no idea who you are. And so, you know, the, if the helmet's removed, then they get to know you. And and he's actually, he's hundred percent correct. You know, I, I still have people come up and talk about that show and, you know, it's kind of what we do with the YouTube channel. You know, people are, are getting to see things that, that we do behind the scenes or here at the house. Yeah, you know, Drag Race High, a bunch of those programs that you were on. And uh, now both of our shows, from what I understand, are on PowerTube TV. So yep. there are people who can watch this show, not just on YouTube, but uh, not just on X. Retweet on X, by the way. We're about to go over 1,000, Clay. We're They're about awesome. to go over 1,000. We're at 995. We can't possibly go over 1,000. <laughs> Nobody is going to repost on X, will they? But anyway, expanding the programming out. And this is why I started WFO over 15 years ago now, I guess, because you need to hear someone talk. You need to be able to get under the hood and hear you like that alcohol thing. Like, didn't know it. Not yep. that it matters, but just didn't so, know that about Clay. Like, you I know, have I have people from I have people from time to time. Remember, we sat out and have a beer. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. It might have been a Mountain Dew in my side, but we have never sat down and had a beer. And I get that every now and then. So, remember, we saw you and we sat down and had a drink. Mm, no. People need to realize See, that's that. funny, Clay. I get, I get the same thing. You can't imagine how many times people come up to me and go, "Hey, Reinhardt, remember the time we sat there and didn't have a beer?" <laughs> no, that wasn't me. Nah. So, <laughs> for all the fans me. out there, uh, and and maybe maybe Clay and Alan don't have this experience, but I do find it difficult to remember every single person I interact with on race weekend. I, I know it's. A lot of people do. They have that gift. I don't have that gift. So people like I can't imagine what it's like for you guys, um, because I have like one or two people come up and like, you remember, the, you know, a year ago we did. That? And I'm like, oh, my God, no, Lenny, Larry, uh, you know, Tim, what, uh, Roger. Like, I just don't it doesn't stick for whatever reason. I mean, I appreciate the interaction. What must that be like for you, Clay? My goodness. Oh, I have the worst I am the worst with names. I'm, I'm just bad with them. I'm sorry. I am. And, you know, you get the, remember we took a picture, you know, I, yeah, I'm so, I feel bad, but, uh, you know, you try to play along and if, then if they put you on the spot, my, I actually said this earlier, my standard answer is I've had a lot of tire shake in my life. I don't remember. <laughs> that's a good one. I can't do that, yeah. Alan. I can't use that. Uh, so that's a good, that's a legit. Reason. Yeah, see, it's funny. That's one of the things that I, I, I really miss. Bob Unkefer and I used to spend a lot of time together when, uh, you know, when he was coming out to the races on a full time basis and working with us. And we kind of had the system that if somebody comes up and goes, Hey, Alan, good to see you. Today. If within the first 20 seconds or something, I don't go, Clay, you know, Bob, right? Then Bob would go, Oh, you know, he's got no manners at all. I'm Bob. And go, oh, I'm Fred. And go, oh, Fred. I'm sorry. I Fred! thought you knew Bob. This my get out of jail free card. But <laughs> I've, I've gotten to the point now, and it actually happened to me this week. I was in uh, uh, down at No Problem Raceway this past week for the Sports Nationals. And a couple of the sportsman racers from down in that part of the world that I had run across, but not in years, come up and said, Hey, you know, do you remember? And I said, I remember exactly who you are. I couldn't pull your name out of the hat if you put a gun to my head. I just, 
I remember you're a motorcycle guy. I remember I saw you in Houston years ago. I remember, but I can't, I can't pull out your name. I'm sorry. And uh, so that's, you know, it's tough. Yeah. That's, that's my the name because I, the name thing is hard. I sometimes get up and have my driver's license so I know what name I should answer to today. That's that's how bad I am. <laughs> All right, Clay Scott wants to know if you think Cletus is eventually going to buy the state of Florida. Uh, you had a great experience <laughs> earlier this year. He had a big thing going on up there at uh, IRP, but uh, the you know you trying to dino <laughs> the dragster. Uh, it didn't work out, but it was a great attempt. But, but talk a little bit about how he's uh, warming up to, you know, he loves playing with cars, but competitive drag racing, what you're doing, it seems like he is becoming more and more interested in that pinnacle of drag racing competition. So here, here's an interesting, funny story. With all of the car things that we all know Cletus has been involved in, he had never seen a top fuel dragster until I went ripping by him at 330 miles an hour. That was the first time he had been around a nitro powered top fuel car, funny car. He had never seen one. And man, how do I say this to cliffhanger that dino thing may not be the last time you see that. I'm just going to leave that there. Nice. Nice. I've always heard of oh, buying the state of Florida. He yeah. did just buy an airport, by the way. He just bought an airport and uh, that that was posted on his channel. And then I, I saw yesterday that uh, he was hanging out with Tyler Perry flying RC planes yesterday. This but, guy's hanging out with everybody, Alan, like Clay Milliken. He's like yeah. the drag racing representative amongst yeah. the uh, the famous YouTube community. Yeah. Cletus well, yeah, and Nitro is not, is not done. Yeah, exactly. Tony Stewart, Tony Stewart. At, uh, at IRP. Yep. Yep. And it was a, that was a boring race until the end. And uh, Tony didn't make it to the finish line on the last lap because <laughs> Tony was schooling well, at least everybody. He started at the back. Yes. So the but first at least part he of the race. Was, at the back. He had to pass the ball at least once. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah. The first 14 yes, laps, I think it was, right? 14 laps yep. from dead yeah. last to <laughs> see in the winter circle. <sighs> Great that, that was we're using the cool. facility though, right? Great we're using this facility for, you know, that that's why we have to have these facilities. We got the round track going again, uh, you know, the straight track, drag strip. Tony Stewart did well there. Gary Pritchett, like a lot of good stories coming out of that. Yeah, there was a lot going on. But, you know, it's, it's amazing just how many car things are kind of starting to tie together between circle track and drag racing. And it's kind of, you know, tied right back to Kalidas, you know, in the Freedom Factory and what him and Vic have done. And now it's made its way to Indy. You know, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Anything that, that makes people come to the racetracks, I like it. I like it. Clay, I I'm appreciate you coming on the show. Um, you know, Reinhardt and I are going to do a little breakdown on the Larice Motorsports Insurance Sports Nationals down there. No problem. And Reinhardt was there on the scene. I've got a little news to talk about in pro stock. If you got to run, uh, thank you very much. If you want to hang, you're welcome to hang. That's up to you. Well, I will just hang out. Why not? All right. I got to give my breaking news, Reinhardt, and then we're going to get your Sports Nationals uh, debrief session. Uh, you know, the get. The Getrix Pro Stock uh, All-Star Callout is at the Gerber Collision and Glass Route 66 Nationals, which is going to be super great. And there's a big press conference uh, tomorrow. We know that Matt Hartford and the Getrix team has had kind of a tough go of it over the past two races. They're going into that big sponsors race, the callout, having DNQ'd at the last two races. So they are going to enter two cars and John DeFlorian, who is a mountain motor guy, has not run 500 cubic inch Pro Stock in over 20 years is going to run Hartford's new car and Hartford's going to be back in, uh, you know, Getrix classic for the call out race. And so that's kind of breaking news. The entry list has just been updated. I am super excited for John DeFlorian, who's Jerry Haas's shop manager to get shot at the 500 cubic inch pro stock guys. I think that's cool. He's a good guy. I've known him forever and ever and ever yeah, back in my eighth grade days. Go ahead, Clay, and then no, I agree 100. I really thought they might put, I thought they might put Dave Conley in the car. You know, Dave drove it uh, down at the Superstar Shootout in Bradenton, but uh, yeah, they've struggled a little bit. And I spoke with Matt uh, at Charlotte after the event was over, and he said, "I've got to try." It. He said, "I know there's nothing wrong with the new car. I know it's not the car. I know, 
but I have to try. I owe it to my sponsors to get out there and try something different since this isn't working. You know, yes, he de at the last two races, but remember the race before that was Phoenix. He qualified 16th. So there's been something uh, that's just off a little bit. And you can talk about intake manifolds. You can talk about the other stuff that, uh, that the KB guys are all having to deal with. But uh, there's there's something there. And, you know, anybody that's raced for any amount of time has been there. Even if you're absolutely 100% convinced this isn't the issue, you still have to prove it. And if you want your sponsors and you want your supporters, you want your people to think truth, truthfully that you are exploring every option, not that you're just so stubborn, you know, I'm going to prove this, I'm going to prove this, I'm going to prove this while yeah. you continue down a rabbit hole. You've got to do something that you believe gives you the best chance to get uh, get pointed back in the right direction. I think this is a good move. And Clay, you're you're uh, you're about to go into the relationship with John DeFlorian, right? Like a, as nice a guy, talk about like slightly undercover. He's in the mountain motor world, but talented and about to get a great opportunity to showcase his talents and abilities. Oh, I mean, just a good guy, you know, and and you can't go wrong putting somebody that actually builds the cars in the car because he not only drives them very well, he's won a lot of races, but he understands the working of the chassis from front to rear. You know, I mean, he's it's no telling how many cars the guy's been involved with, you know, and so I think it's a great opportunity for him. And uh, it'll be interesting because uh, there's going to be a little bit of RPM difference on the shift points of that mountain motor and that 500 incher. <laughs> Yes, and don't hit that limiter either. Uh, had Mark Jones on the show yesterday, top dragster winner at the Sports Nationals. He was on the Ignition podcast, audio only, but you know, since he runs a WFO sticker and he's one of our Patreons, he won the race. He got to be on the show, and uh, amazing interview. You guys want to hear uh, Mark? Go check it out. But Alan, what? How was no problem? I hear the track is amazing. Nelson and Marla are doing a great job, but you were there. Break it down for us. Yeah, Nelson and Marla have done a terrific job with with the racetrack. Uh, Mother Nature wasn't particularly kind to us. Uh, on Thursday, uh, Larice had a bunch of big dollar shootouts that they had lined up and we didn't get all of those finished. And then Friday, we never did a burnout. It kind of gave us a, you know, a soaking rain most of the morning. And even though the evening, the afternoon, the sun did come out and it cleared up, but the track needed to be scraped. They needed, it was peeling rubber up. And so they never even attempted to do anything on Friday. Once it quit raining, um, between the Division Four folks and Nelson and his staff, they just jumped on it so that the track would be ready to go on Saturday and Sunday. And then we ended up with two very full days, Saturday and Sunday, making it all happen. But, no, it's a terrific facility. Um, I didn't realize the, what the inspiration for the place was. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but, you know, Pat Joffrey on um, former stock super stock racer is the guy that actually built the racetrack a number of years ago. And when he was racing, and he was racing at a pretty high level, um, you know, taking it very as, as professional a team as you could have in stock and super stock, you know, um, was at State Capital Raceway, wanting to do some testing, wanted to do some stuff. And the guy that ran State Capital Raceway said, oh, well, you know, there's not enough cars, there's not enough, you know, and it's, we're just going to cancel the event. He went, you're going to what? He said, look, I, what do we got to do? What do we got to do? And the guy told him, if you don't like the way I run my racetrack, go build your own. And he said, okay. Well, so he yeah. went and bought a piece of land and originally was just building a place that he could test because he was going to very seriously go out and chase championships and chase stuff and needed a place that he could test. And then that turned into a legitimate racetrack. And for those that don't know the reason that Pat's not driving anymore, he was involved in a horrendous highway accident a number of years ago, mm. like was lucky to walk away from it. And that pretty much was the end of his racing career. But he was out at the racetrack. He was a grand marshal over the weekend. And uh, I think he's pretty proud of what uh, what Nelson and Marlon and the people that have come after him have done. Um, Nelson made no bones about it. He would like for his facility to be the new home of the Spring National since we no longer have Houston. It's, you know, a few hours down I-10. He has enough land. Um, he's got a, a terrific racetrack. They do need some more infrastructure and some other stuff, but he's also, uh, he's talking with, you know, the state legislature and the other stuff about tourism dollars and some of the stuff that a lot of tracks are doing. And his plan is somewhere down the road, hopefully in the not too distant future for the spring nationals to be there. I mean, you know, anybody has been long around long enough to remember the Cajun nationals that used to be a heck of a party on the NHRA schedule way back in the day. 
Louisiana's got some really hardcore fans down there. And I think, you know, it's about an hour from Baton Rouge, a little bit more than that from New Orleans, uh, a few hours from Houston. But I think they've got plenty of folks down there to draw from that would come out and fill the place up if they could make it happen. And that's Nelson's, that's his stated plan. You know, I like where we are now. We're going forward. Here's where we'd like to be two or three or maybe four years down the road. And he's investing heavily time, money, and, and everything he can put forth to make it happen. What do you think? What of that, a Mike? fun racetrack. I, I've been there many, many, many times. They they have a good time at that place. You know, it's uh, the Garrison family. If you know those folks, they've got a house as you come in. I've stayed in their house many times. It's, uh, you know, they'll stay. I've been there before and, you know, when the racing's done for the evening, you know, the uh, crawfish bowl happens right on the starting line. Everybody yeah. comes and eats. I mean, it's just a fun, fun facility. I love that place. What airport did you fly yeah, into? It definitely is. I drove. I went to Baton Rouge. Okay. I, so I've never been to that part of the country. That's part of it. Like I have never been New Orleans, any of that. Not that I would love to uh, do that. And I, Nelson and Marla, like they are from you know Hollywood, Florida originally. And he ran Palm Beach for a while until he had too many good ideas and they had to let him go. You know how it goes. Track managers don't try to be successful. Big mistake. And so in, but it, it all worked out in the end. And uh, it's great to see them getting the opportunity to do well. Uh, I see, so we got Walt. Walt says he got lucky and he won first round with a broken throttle linkage. What else, Alan? I know Chase Williams won in Comp Eliminator. I know Trevor Boyd won in Super Stock. I know the country puppy Jimmy Hidalgo Jr. won in Stock. Kyle Rickman got it done in uh, Super Comp. Jason McClure in Super Gas. Uh, Jimmy Daniel in Super Street. And uh, let's see, top dragster was Mark Jones, who was on the show last night. Anything else? No. Rick well, uh, Mark Jones, in top sports. Mark sports. Jones is a fascinating story, and I'm not. I'm just going to steer everybody to the podcast and let them. Uh, I'm sure that he talked about what he's been through over the course of the last few months, uh, getting back into the race car. But it was just there was a lot of terrific racing. You know, Rickman when he won Super Comp, that was a pressure off run because his wife had won the shootout the day before, and I pointed that out a time or two when he was on the starting line, you know, well, there's one trophy going home to the Rickman household. And if he doesn't want to spend the rest of his life listening to Tara and say, honey, did you see the trophy that I won at the sports nationals? What happened to you? Did you better come through with this deal? And he did. Uh, Doug Fasselor was in the final of the super stock with a Hemi car. And the last time a genuine 426 Hemi, a car, 68 starter Barracuda one was 2009. So, you know, not to be rooting for anybody, but, uh, Doug was, Doug was a little annoyed with himself in the final. He kind of rolled in, got both balls backed up. By the time he got, he'd kind of thrown himself out of the rhythm, so uh, took him out of the race. But there was, it was just a lot of really good racing, good activity. You know, without having the nitro cars and without having the alcohol cars there, um, it just makes it a little bit more of a laid-back atmosphere. And as Clay mentioned, those guys are really good about having a good time. They had live music one night. They were cooking food a couple of nights. Uh, they had a lot of good kind of side stuff going on and other things for the entertainment of the fans as well as the racers. They did have a pretty good fan turnout on Saturday. It was their big fan day. But I think uh, other than the weather, I, everything about the everything about the event, I give like two thumbs up. I, it, I'm glad I got to go. Um, I'm sure they're going to continue to do the sports nationals. And like I said Nelson has a plan in place. He knows he needs you know some more parking, some more infrastructure, some more grandstands, some more other things, but. His plan is to be the home of the Spring National somewhere a couple of years down the road. Can't wait. Make it happen. Sooner rather than later. Um, Joe Lee Stanfield says you should have driven four hours in towards Stanfield Racing Engines, Alan. What the well, heck? Well, I probably should have done that yesterday when I was doing my, you know me, I'm the, uh, I'm the first guy out, you know, first flight out in the morning guy. But for whatever reason, um, the Monday morning early, early flight out was stupid expensive. And so I took the evening flight out. And I I did have some time in the day to kill, but I got up, got some stuff done around the hotel. By the time I got out of there, I didn't have enough time, I don't think, to drive all the way there and all the way back to Baton Rouge. But if you go back to the future, then I'm going to plan on taking an extra day either on the front or on the back because there's a couple of Louisiana things. Uh, I've been to New Orleans before. I've been to Mardi Gras. I've done some of that stuff. But there are a couple of Louisiana things that I wanted to do that I didn't get a chance to, and Stanfield Engines would be high on that list. There you go. And uh, Maddie Gordon 
Just got to get that one yeah. in before I let you guys go. Uh, well, you know, smoke. Obviously, we were talking Matt. sports nationals. I figured you were going to come back to uh, you were going to come back to Andy. But yeah, well, Nicole Nicole mentioned it uh, out there. She wants us to get in before the show is over. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, her first uh, her first win in the alcohol funny car certainly won't be the last. If you look at what she's done the first couple of races, um, she's been right there. So you know, once that tide turns, and you know, she beat Sean Bellamere along the way. Phil has had a car that was running very well. Um, but, uh, you know, their, their goal, their stated goal at the beginning of the year was to finish top five. And I think that that is a very achievable goal. I think that she's certainly going to win some more races. Uh, I'm just sorry I wasn't there. I would have, I would have liked to have been there for her first one. Welcome back, Clay. We missed you. Yeah. I know. I don't know what we did there. Yeah, we don't know what happened with Clay. Like. Who knows? Magical it's interweb thing again. The internet, right? 1165, 1167 listeners right now, guys. That's awesome. Everybody is reposting on X. No, it's good. It's good. The way, uh, you know, Clay and I started with the whole, like, behind the scenes of how this whole streaming deal works and how the Facebook group isn't the deal and subscribe and click the bell on YouTube, all that stuff. It's, it's amazing that we can have this conversation, really. It's the way I choose to look at it. Miracle. All right, gentlemen. Great job. Clay, any final thoughts? Anything you would like to uh, note or point out to the audience? Any action step you'd like them to take before we part ways? Well, obviously looking forward to Chicago. And uh, I saw Lee mention this on, uh, on on one of the comments. It was weird, Alan, having you at the top end. That was that was strange the other this past week. Kind of neat, but strange at the same time, you know, but... Uh, Man, I tell you what, I, I appreciate you said you've been doing this for 15 years. And that's, Joe, that's a long time to keep doing these kind of things. You know, I, I kind of did like interviews on, on Facebook. And I think people should, you and Alan have done this a long time together, I know. But people have no idea how hard it is to arrange getting somebody to sit down and do these sort of things. And I just want to thank both of you guys for you know, continually doing this, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world, you know, to get somebody to schedule it. And then it's amazing how many people you run into that's like, I don't know how to do that, you know, and, and it, it's, it's awesome. And I just want to say thank you for all the years of uh, you two doing this together. And Joe, you just keep swinging away at it, brother. Thank you. So I, I mean so much, like, honestly, uh, it, it, uh, so, you know, I was at XM and we had the NASCAR radio contract and then they lost it to Sirius when there were two separate companies and everybody in the company panicked because they were new. There were just over 2 million subscribers. This was early on. And I was like, guys, guys, it's cool, man. There's other motorsports. We'll do our own thing. We can keep talking about NASCAR all we want. We don't have to be the official. In fact, somehow, some, some ways it's better to not be the official. You can say things without consequence. And uh, I reached out to the NHRA and they put me together with Alan. And I think our first shows were in early 2006 that he and I have been doing the weekly Tuesday conversation. It is now 2024. Crazy. In 2008, the two companies merged and there was a bloodbath and they fired everybody, myself included, uh, all the XM people, the real talented folks, artsy. And, uh, you know, it, 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 they continue on and they're doing great and all of that. But at that moment, uh, I decided, you know, like I'm going to keep on going. I'm just going to do my own XM satellite radio out of my house in the studio that they built. And I talked to Reinhardt. Reinhardt's, no, man, we're going to keep on doing it. Like he could have easily checked out on the deal. Uh, you know, he had no idea that there was like five listeners the first show. <laughs> and we have we have now, you know, over time grown it. And uh, I through that, I got the job at the NHRA because they, you know, hurt Bob Fry retired. And and I got a couple of positive, uh, you know, notes. And uh, look, here I am and in this nice, wonderful situation where, um, you know, a bunch of new shows have popped up and, and, and YouTube is giving people opportunity. And this drag racing community, Clay, like, see, I like Formula One, but I love what we do so much better. And uh, NASCAR, too. I love it. But, guys, what we get to experience every other weekend at the NHRA Mission Foods Drag Racing Series is an unbelievable experience that, for whatever reason, it is only as big as it is. We can make it bigger if we so choose. And that's what WFO has been all about since uh, since becoming a podcast and then a live stream during the pandemic, et cetera. So thank you for saying that, Clay. Like it really means there are days where I question, like, should I get a real gig? You know, should I get a job? 
go to the lumber yard. Uh, but uh, you have just locked me in that job. six months. Yes. How was that? I had a forklift job. I like drag racing better. Drag racing is better than forklifting. <laughs> it just is. But we've got some listeners in our audience that are also forklift drivers. And, they, you know, they love their gig and they listen to WFO. But thank you for saying that, Clay. And uh, good luck with the GTO. Most importantly, we need a big, big big sale maybe someone will be so kind and they'll do like they did with daryl gwynn just to put the idea they would buy the car and then donate it back to you guys to sell it again that that's, would be awesome that's what really good charitable altruistic folks did for daryl gwynn multiple times during his miami project days mm -hmm. and uh, it's not impossible that someone might do that for you guys i hope that's what happens whether that happens or not, I just hope it goes for, you know, a lot of money. Again, 10 scholarships, it, it, that's that's pretty cool. The CRC, Summit, Edelbrock, everybody involved with that thing, is it's just such a cool project. And the more we can get people to, to realize what kind of money can be made from working with their hands. Uh, I, I did it for years and years and years, and I still work with my hands. It's just you know, one of those things that we just can hope that the right person is at Meekum or online and, and they they buy that car for the right reasons. And it's not necessarily, you know, just for the car. It's for the cause. It's the way I see it. I agree. It's for the cause. All right, Clay, thank you so much. There thank you. Clay Milliken with us here on WFO. And I know you could tell by your face, Alan, that you had something you wanted to say. He's probably still down there. No, I would just, uh, I, I agree with what he said. I, you know, I love what I do for a living now, but I also very much loved my time working in the construction company, being a shop foreman. I like being, you know, I, I'm a hands-on guy. There's a reason I have a machine shop. I like going out and working on you know, whether it's tractors, whether it's excavators, whether it's, you know, small tools in the shop, whether it's whatever, I enjoy doing that. And if I had to go back to do that to make a living tomorrow, I certainly wouldn't be kicking rocks on my way to the office every morning. I like working with my hands, which is why I still have a shop. And I just think it's funny that, you know, for a generation or two generations, everybody told them, you know, be a doctor, be a lawyer, go into computers, be a doctor, be a lawyer, go into computers. That's what everybody made their kids do. And now those some people are upset because they can't find a plumber. So, you know, my plumber does very well, by the way, you know, the last time <laughs> when my water heater went out and it's like, uh, you know, hello, uh, my plumber does very well, believe me. But there are a lot of ways out there that young people can make a really nice living without having mounds and mounds of school debt. I mean, that's one of the things we talk about at the Yes program uh, each and every week when we go out and have students come in from high schools, from trade schools, from the local community for a little career opportunities thing that. There's a legitimate shop. And this is a true story. My, when I was growing up, my best buddy, Mark, Mark and I both had a sister. Neither one of us had a brother. And we were about 30 days apart in age. And we both liked bicycles and then mini bikes and then cars. And we you know, grew up together. And he got married, moved away, was gone for 10 or 15 years or something. He was a master mechanic working on the Mopar side of things. And, uh, I mean, legitimately a certified master Dodge technician. And he moved back to town, whatever it's been now, six, seven, eight, ten years ago. And when he came back to town, he reached out. He goes, Hey, let's go have a beer and let's catch up. And so we are said, you know, well, how's this? How's that? What you been up to? Da, da, da. And I said, Are you working? And he said, No, not yet. And I said, oh, I said, What are we waiting for? He said, Well, you know, there's two Dodge dealers in town. And I said, Yeah. He said, Well, they're fighting over me. He said, I'm gonna wait and see who's gonna pay me the most. Because when he reached out as a certified master technician and said, I'm moving to Tucson. Do you want to hire me? Both, they both said, yes, right now. How fast can you be here? And he said, well, I'm talking to the other guy too. So make me an offer. And he did very well for himself, very well for himself. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities out there that, you know, and Joe, you know me, I mean, being at the racetrack is one thing, but, I'm not a guy who can go sit in a cube farm day after day after day. I just can't no do way. that. I need to be out someplace, whether, you know, if it's outside working in the field or if it's in the shop or, if, you know, the, the time I spent working with David Dickens. Heck, the first year I went down there, I got down there sometime mid-November and didn't go home until April. And we worked every single day, every Saturday, every Sunday, every holiday, every, I mean, Christmas Day, we got up and went, oh, hey, yeah, this is nice. Okay, let's go to the shop. Uh, Thanksgiving day, we left the shop about two o'clock, came home and had dinner and then went back to the shop because there was stuff to do. 
but I love doing it. I love it. And then when you get to see the fruit of your labor, whether it's on the racetrack or whether it's, you know, the car you were working on that drives away and the customer's got a smile on his face or whether the eight guys that have been standing around twiddling their thumbs on the job now can go back to work because they've got an excavator working again. I, that, that satisfaction is, is terrific to me. I love it. Love it. Garrett, well, I think you, you nailed it. And, uh, it, you know, this is like a, like a real issue that, you know, we don't really delve into this world, but, um, years ago, there was a decision to un deliberately, uh, you know, malign, undervalue, whatever you want to say. You could maybe you could say it was deliberate. You could say it was an accident. But certainly in movies, like I was just watching those John Hughes movies this past weekend for a few minutes. You know, think about those movies that we watch as a kid. The worst, like if your dad was a plumber, you were embarrassed, right? Because you you know he did not have a white collar. And I'm not making it classism thing. It, that was put forth. That was like out there. You don't want to do that. Everybody, and, and it's it's just not the right way to think about something. You think about something as in you do what you're interested in. And the kid who feels like, man, I want to build an engine. I want to make chips in a machine shop. It should be nurtured that you you're interested in that. Yeah. It looks like really interesting. I'd like to do it. Then that's what you should do. Not defining yourself by the job you have because you are whatever, like I've got a good job. And so people will value me. It, no, you people will value you if you're happy. If you're happy and you get up every day with a positive mental attitude because you're going to do something that makes you feel good about yourself. You don't feel good about yourself because of what you do. You feel good about yourself because you're doing something you love. And um, I think we lost that in the media. We lost that in our culture a little bit. But the good news is I think it's it's coming back. You see it back like what Clay is doing, what, um, you know, like, like Sam Tech, obviously. Uh, Hartford's in on a couple of things. Like people are nurturing that. And look what holds us back in drag racing. Like what really holds us back from having five more teams? If five NASCAR team owners showed up with checks, we'd have a tough time like filling their teams out. Right. With crew chiefs and everything. So there's opportunity there also. Um, I'm glad we kind of figured it out, but it did. We did have a little bit of a down period. Well, but it's it, and it's also like anything else. And it's one of the things that Bob Tasca talks about extensively at the Yes program. And I, I touch on a little bit as well. You know, your effort and your desire to succeed is going to be, you know, no matter what you do. OK, I mean, what if you're a welder? OK, you're a welder. That's what you are. You're a welder. You can go make a living being a welder and you can be okay being a welder and you can, you know, put roof over your head and, and you can, you know, feed your kids and you can do all that and you can be a welder. But can you really be successful being a welder? I mean, can you, is there a possibility to really make a lot of money as a welder? Have you heard of Billy Torrance? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If you have the drive, if you have the desire to go, this is something I'm going to do, I'm going to pursue, I'm going to go after, and uh, he's done pretty well for himself. But started out as a pipeline nerd, right? I mean, welder on the back of a pickup and going out in the field and welding pipe together. That was his job. And then he yeah. said, hmm, I'm going to go all in. And there's guys that are doing that right now that make a really, really nice living. Maybe not a top fuel living, but... They make a well, really the nice entrepreneurial yeah. spirit. Whoever, what, who says that what you do right uh, initially is the way it's going to end up either. It's just the first step of a longer journey. But as you mentioned, the cubicle farm, you know, that seems like a place that squishes your soul. And uh, there's a lot of movies that says that as well. Office Space. Just go watch that. Alan, great job Thank as you. usual. Okay. But if computers are your, your thing, if you like crunching numbers, if you like that, then great. Go do that. That's just not my thing. I'm glad okay. it's somebody's thing, but it's not mine. Let's reprise the last race. Scott Burley has put a quote up. Where does this quote come from? The world needs ditch diggers too. <laughs> that would be from Caddyshack. A Judge Smales original. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Poor Danny Noonan. Oh, man. All right, Alan. Great job. This was fun. Thanks, Joe. Um, to everybody's mother out there, I hope you have a great weekend. I hope your Mother's Day weekend is wonderful, and uh, I will see you uh, next week. That is right. We'll be back. We'll be getting ready for Route 66 Raceway and the Gerber Collision in Glass. Uh, Route 66 NHRA Nationals and the Getrix Pro Stock All-Star Call-Out. It's going to be great. Thank you, Alan.
Here he goes, go. the voice of the NHRA. Alan Reinhardt joins us each week right here on WFO Radio. Yeah, that Judge Smales, man. What a jerk. What a jerk. He had it coming. And, uh, you know, and Jim Parks, Parks, trying to bait me into doing my Dusty Rhodes uh, impression. Son of a plumber from Austin, Texas, daddy. Right? Uh, yeah. Gold watch. Right? Hard times on Dusty Rhodes. Uh, but maybe your calling is to be an attorney. And you love that. And that's not negative either. That's the thing. It's not about what you do. It's about who are you and are you happy doing what you do? And if you really love, uh, you know, welding things together, there are jobs. And if you really love, uh, you know, digging into the earth or demolishing something, or there are so many jobs out there, you just have to be a driven person. You have to show up on time. You have to do what you say you're going to do. And you have to realize that there's going to be a little paying of dues early on. Like, am I, do I get to be the CEO yet? Am I the lead? Uh, no, 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 not yet. You gotta, there's lots to learn along the way. And, um, I like to think that, you know, the kids these days, many of them are demonstrating that maybe not all of them, certainly the ones that aren't are getting a lot of pub. All right, let's see what you guys have to say out there. Put your comments in the comment section. Clay Milliken, how about it? Subscribe, click the bell. What a great conversation. Clay, I feel like a genius inviting Clay on the show. Tremendous. Also want to remind everybody about our Patreon listener club. These are VIP listeners. They get specialized content that, uh, you know, because they pay a monthly. They pick a monthly that they like and they pay it. And they get a, if you sign up for a year, you get a t-shirt in addition to decals and patches and all the different great stuff that we go WFO, but you get to hear it from Heiner pro stock show, a genuine race winning pro stock crew chief telling you about like what the decisions are that are being made and all the stuff that's going on in pro stock. If you love pro stock, you will love that show. No doubt. They get to watch the, the video of the ignition podcast. And remember Mark Jones was on. You are definitely going to want to hear, uh, he had a medical procedure that sounded frightening and he returned in his first quarter mile race he got a win uh amazing amazing all that for our patreons patreon.com slash wfo radio frank hawley's drag racing school longtime sponsor over 10 years with wfo radio frank hawley.com go drive a dragster guys like really learn what this is about why clay does what clay does because driving a dragster is an experience and frank hawley gives you a great way to do it you and your friends can make a great gift frankhawley.com. Tell them you heard about it on WFO Radio. Our great friends at Samtech been on board with WFO Radio for a long time. Samtech.edu, the School of Automotive Machinists and Technology. Start your education at full speed. Plus our friends, Bernie's Speed Shop, Foggit. We started the show telling you about Foggit. If you don't have a can of Foggit in your house or your shop, you're making a big mistake because it protects the inside of your cylinder finish, not just on your race car, on whatever it is that combusts. Because, you know, sulfur is a product of combustion. You mix it with water from condensation. After you turn it off, you got sulfuric acid running down the inside of your cylinders. The fogget stops and slows that down. F-O-G-G-I-T available at Summit. CWT Industries. Tomorrow, Randy Neal, Balance Machines. Everything you ever wanted to know, all the information I can extract, be here. And I'm working on another guest that I don't want to say, you know, who or how just yet. Just join us at noon tomorrow, WFO Radio. And if you're out there watching on YouTube, subscribe, click the bell, follow us on social media, WFO Radio on X and on Instagram, and you'll never miss a show. Simple as that. Phillips Connect, Total Seal. Thanks to Matt Hartford for the breaking news. Hey, that John DeFlorian news, that's big to me. John DeFlorian is a veteran mountain motor pro stock racer who is Jerry Haas's shop foreman, who is a really good, fun person and personality. He's going to get his first shot, I think this century, at 500 cubic inch pro stock, driving Hartford's other car. There's going to be two Hartford cars in the field. And uh, Hartford breaking out Getrick's Classic, the car from last year that won the U.S. Nationals, the car that went on to finish third in the points, that car is coming back for the pro stock all-star callout. Erica Enders gets the first pick. Erica Enders, Greg Anderson, Dallas Glenn, Troy Coughlin. Those are your first four. Aaron Stanfield, Matt Hartford, Christian Quadrant, Derek Kramer. Who's Erica going to pick? If you're Erica, you've had a lot, a tremendous rivalry with Hartford. He's down. You could get him. You could humiliate him by picking him and beating him. But Hartford breaks out the old car, and all of a sudden that changes the calculus. 
because, um, you know, new chassis, new manifold rules, new tune up too many new variables. And so they eliminated one of the variables. They're going to work on the new car with DeFlorian driving. They're going to try to win the Getrix all-star call out with uh, old reliable, you know, who knows? Uh, that's interesting. So maybe Erica will pick Greg and just be a super badass. Erica picks Greg, beats Greg. That's it. Like legendary. Um, this press conference tomorrow. I'm interested to see how this is handled. But Erica Enders is going to control the show. And we'll see who she picks. There's a lot to be said about. Do you go Robert Hyde style and pick the person that you think is the baddest person in, in the field and try to whoop them first round? Or do you try to pick the wounded, you know, duckling, the, the you know, the weak uh, antelope, you know, and, and prey on, you know, the sickly? Uh, do people respect that? Is that the way this entertainment based race should go? I talk to a lot of racers. I'm always trying to extract something cool like Clay Milliken. You know, he says cool things regardless. But. Is it good for the NHRA to get Getrix on board, the all-star call out to set up this huge system for one person to get the opportunity to do something that we you know, think would be cool, bravado based, right? I pick you. And wh wh who's the person that they pick? Like the, the one with the, you know, the gimpy leg that's dragging at the back of them, the lions jump on it. Or do they pick someone that's tough and set up this monster matchup and you go out there and you whoop them and you prove to the world, uh, you know, what, which is cooler. That is your YouTube question of the week. What's cooler. If you're in the call out race to pick the toughest competitor or to pick the weakest competitor. And this is for the comments. Once the YouTube video posts down there below the video, really, it's just a gimmick to get a lot of comments on there so that the algorithm spreads the show out there, really, because everybody is commenting. Your YouTube question of the week is that, what do you prefer? What makes someone cooler, better, stronger, more likable when they call out the weakest or when they call out the strongest? What do you think? Thanks to Clay Milliken for joining us on the show. I've got a couple of seconds. Don't forget to get your WFO radio gear while it's on sale. The link is in the chat several times. 16 bucks. Someone else out there is making Miami Hollywood Speedway shirts, guys. They took my idea and they've ripped off the Miami Hollywood shirt. Get yours here. Okay. Leah says it's got to be the best to be got to be the best to be the best. Woo. Ric Flair's in the news. Did you see that? Yeah, but you got to put this in the YouTube. This is the YouTube question of the week goes down there in the comment section make a brave call the florian is one super cool guy no doubt frisky it's going to be a great weekend in joliet hopefully everybody joins us hit the like button people yeah help us defeat the algorithm wfo clay milliken oh my god such a nice thing he said but we're not a big corporation we are privately owned family owned company and we need all the help we can get sharing the show look we're in the last minute of the show we're over we're over 1280 people watching out there thank you guys thank you we're here every week there's so much corporate media out there i'm the guy who does everything giovanni in miami helps out steve brenwald helps out patrick the webmaster helps out joe you put your heart and your soul into your work that's why you support this great show today that's so great scott thank you did i mention uh, t-shirts are on sale right now Excellent show today with Clay and Alan. Well, Clay was great. And Clay, you know, in this case, it wasn't hard to book the guest. Like tomorrow's guest, 12 noon, right before Randy Neal from CWT Industries. This is a tough one because I don't know who it's going to be just yet. I'm like thinking maybe it could be Maddie Gordon. Like I don't know. So I'm going to have to put some deep thought into this. Everybody loving the show. Thank you very much. Cubicle Farm wasn't the place for me either. No, it's just not. Definitely not. Great show. Everybody loving the show. Again, guys, thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day. I'll be on tomorrow, but all the moms out there, happy Mother's Day. Can't say it enough. We appreciate the moms. We appreciate everybody who supports our program. Thank you so much, guys. WFO. Like this show? Want more? Then head to WatchPTTV.com, the new 100% free PowerTube TV streaming network. Home of the best classic and new motorsports racing and build shows on the web.